evil never takes a vacation. Hey everybody, welcome to Crime Over Cocktails. I'm Tiffany, your host, and today I'm keeping it simple and sticking with my Mick Ultra while we discuss the case of Oba Chandler. Now, this was actually a fan request off of my Instagram page, so thank you, Des, for this request. I actually did know this case. <laughs> shocker and I I wanted to do it and I know eventually I would have gotten to this case because it is just so crazy but all right enough about that let's jump in Oba Chandler was born on October 11th 1946 in Cincinnati Ohio he was the fourth out of five children to his parents Margaret and Oba Sr. They seemed to be a happy family, but when Oba was just 10 years old, the family took a hard hit when his father hung himself in the basement of their apartment. Oba took the death of his father extremely hard. Observers at the funeral said that while the gravediggers were covering the coffin with dirt, that he jumped into the open grave. That is just heartbreaking. This would lead him down a different path for the rest of his life. At the age of 14, he started stealing cars. He had already been arrested somewhere around 20 times as a juvenile, which only grew as he got older. As he became an adult, his crimes started to get worse and worse. He started doing armed robbery, kidnapping, using counterfeit money. He even got caught peeping into a woman's house while he was masturbating. He was definitely on a bad path. Bad, bad path. When he moved to Florida, he decided that it might help him in some cases if he had an accomplice. They did a home invasion at a couple's home. They tied the male homeowner up with speaker wire so Oba could take the woman homeowner into the bedroom so he could taunt her with his pistol. They then robbed them and left the home. Things took an even darker turn on June 1st, 1989, when Joan Rogers, age 36, and her two daughters, Michelle, 17, and Christy, 14, they were lost and needed directions. They were on vacation from Wilshire, Ohio. Her husband, Hal Rogers, stayed behind to run and take care of their dairy farm. This was the first time they had ever left their home state. They were super excited. Originally, their vacation was that they drove to Orlando and then they were going to turn back around and drive back to Ohio. Well, she decided that why don't we just take an extra day and they came down to Tampa Bay. This is my hometown. They were right here. Oba gave them directions to find their hotel and he offered to take them out on a sunset cruise of Tampa Bay. He told them that he could meet them at the Courtney Campbell Causeway, also known as Pier 60. On June 4th, 1989, a call came into the police station. It was coming from a sailboat that was under the Sunshine Skyway Bridge. There was a body floating. Just two miles away from that body, they find another body. This one was floating off the pier in St. Petersburg. While they were going and retrieving the second body... A third body came in. Now, this body was found 200 yards east of the second body. All three women were found floating face down, naked from the waist down, and bound with rope. Okay. This rope was wrapped around their necks, which went to hold their arms also together, which then attached them to a concrete block. However, these girls got into this water, they knew that whoever did this, they were going to make sure that they either died from suffocation or from drowning. There was no coming back from this. The bodies were not able to be identified until a week later. That's when Hal called the cops trying to find his family. He's still back in Ohio taking care of the dairy farm. He has no idea where his family is. They're not answering their phones, and this isn't like them. And it wasn't just Joan. He couldn't get a hold of the girls either. So he knew something was wrong. 
On June 8th, police go to the hotel room. When they got there, they could tell that the beds were never slept in. The room was barely even touched. Nothing was disturbed. You couldn't tell that anything happened in the room. Everything was just neatly around. They collect fingerprints from the room. When that came back, they were able to match that to the bodies that were found in the bay, along with dental records. In one of the suitcases, they found a camera. And when they went and got them printed, (laughs) who remembers printing photos? In some of the pictures, they could see that Michelle was sitting on the floor in that room. They had made it there. Their stuff was there. They had to be there for at least some time. They estimated that they got there around 1230 that afternoon. The last picture on the camera was taken off of the balcony from that room and it had a sunset in the background. So they were actually at the hotel for sunset. They didn't take the boat cruise. Guests even reported seeing them at 730 that night at the hotel's restaurant. So they figured that they must have left the room somewhere between 8.30 and 9 p.m. Marine researchers at the University of South Florida estimated that the bodies were thrown from something more like a boat. It couldn't be like from a bridge or like just dumped off the side. And they said that this was due to the current patterns. When they did the autopsy, they found water in all three of their lungs. What that tells us is that these women were thrown into the bay like this alive. You know, that is disgusting. Nobody deserves to die that way. Nobody. Your arms are tied, you got a noose around your neck, and you're tied to a cylinder block. Just to think what could have been going through people's minds in a state like that is just absolutely terrifying. They found Jones' 1984 Oldsmobile at the boat dock by the Courtney Campbell Causeway. Inside of the car, they found a brochure. The brochure had handwritten directions and a description of a boat on it. Tons of tips came in, but the case went cold for three years. They looked into her husband, you know, since he didn't go on vacation to see maybe if he had orchestrated this himself or did he hire somebody to do it. But ultimately, he was cleared of any wrongdoing and he had nothing to do with it. It wasn't until a billboard went up. This billboard showed the brochure that was found in Joan's car. They wanted to see if anybody could recognize the handwriting. Will anyone recognize anything in it? This was the first time a billboard was ever used for a criminal investigation. And it paid off. And as you can see now, they do it all the time. A call came into the police saying that he recognized the handwriting. And he recognized this handwriting as his former neighbor, Oba Chandler. What in the hell are the chances of that? I'm sorry. That is fucking crazy. Do you know what your neighbor's handwriting looks like? Because I sure as hell don't. And he wasn't even still your neighbor. He was a former neighbor. That part just blew my mind. After they did a handwriting analysis and matched a palm print on the brochure, They were able to confirm that it was Oba Chandler. They arrested him on September 24th, 1992. By then, he had already sold his boat, moved from Tampa. They went to Port Orange near Daytona Beach. Him and the whole fam. He took off as soon as they put that billboard up. At his trial, against his lawyer's advice, he took the stand on his own behalf. He claimed that he did meet them, yes, but that he gave them directions and sent them on his way. He never saw them again. Not until they put up the billboards and he would see it in like newspaper coverage, on the news, stuff like that. But no, not in person, not after that fact, nothing. He also did admit to being on Tampa Bay that evening, but he swore that he was out there fishing by himself and that he happened to get a gas line link because his engine wouldn't start. He told police that not only did he call the Coast Guard, but he also called the Florida Marine Patrol. But everybody told him that they were too busy to come and help him. I find that a little far-fetched. 
When they checked phone records, there were no records of these calls. But there were three calls. And those went out from his boat to his home. And these calls were between 1 and 5 a.m. Like, what are you doing? He said that he fixed the line with duct tape and he returned to shore. Your new modern day Swiss Family Robinson. A boat mechanic testified for the prosecution, stating that his story just was not plausible. His fuel lines were directed upward, which means that when he had the leak, it would have been spraying up into the air. He also said that the gasoline would have dissolved the adhesive to the duct tape. They also had a surprise character witness, Judy Blair. Judy and her friend Barbara were on vacation from Canada when they also encountered Oba over in Madeira Beach. And this was just two weeks before the triple homicide. He had offered them a ride on his boat, but he had actually introduced himself as Dave. Barbara decided she wanted no part of it, but Judy did take him up on the offer and she went out. Judy claims that while she was alone with him in the boat, he raped her. And then he returned her back to shore like nothing ever happened. He was never charged with this crime. They believe he made the calls to home to explain to his wife where the hell he's been. Like, dude, it's 5 a.m. I'm sure she's like, what are you doing? He needed to shut her up and also create an alibi. A former employee testified that he had bragged about dating three women on the bay on the night of the murders. And that when he arrived the next morning by boat, he was delivering his materials because he was an aluminum contractor. He delivered the materials and he went right back out immediately. I guess that wasn't common for him. So that was kind of weird. His daughter, Crystal, she said that she was afraid of her father. He told her that he had killed three women and that he was afraid to return to Tampa. When he was on the stand, he did admit to having sex with Judy. His defense was, yes, I had sex with Judy, but it was consensual. The problem was she changed her mind in the middle of it. On November 4th, 1994, Oba was found guilty and sentenced to death. He has always maintained his innocence and they've never found any evidence of a second person helping him with the crime. They knew that he was brazen enough to approach multiple potential targets by himself because what he did to the two girls, the Canadians. He served his time at the Union Correctional Institution and all of his appeals were denied. His last appeal was denied in May of 2007. Profiling experts believe that Oba probably did kill previously because you usually don't start off by killing three at once. Like, you kind of got to perfect your craft. You got to feel comfortable. I mean, dealing with three people, you never know how that's going to end. They could have all ganged up on him. On October 10th, 2011, Governor Rick Scott whoop, whoop, signed his death warrant. His execution was set for November 15th, 2011 at 4 o'clock. When this happened, Oba said that his last words before his execution would be, Kiss my rosy red ass. Classy. For his last meal that was served around 11 a.m., he had two salami and mustard sandwiches on white bread and half of a peanut butter and grape jelly sandwich. He asked for unsweetened iced tea, but he didn't drink it. and Instead, he had a coffee. He was executed at 4.08. He declined to make a verbal statement, but instead he did leave a written statement. It was short, it was simple, and pretty much it just said, you are killing an innocent man today. After his conviction, his wife filed for divorce. She took all of his parental rights away from him. His daughter, Valerie, really believes that he was innocent. She doesn't believe that there's any way he was able to do this all by himself. But on the other hand, his daughter, Susan, believes that her father is a monster and he's right where he belongs. He went 17 years in prison without ever having a single visitor. That's fucking lonely, but I'm sorry. That's what you get. That had to be the worst death ever. I'm so, like, nobody deserves to die like that. That is pure fucking torture mentally, physically, emotionally. 17 years, I'm okay with that being executed after that. That's still a long time to sit there and think about what you did. 
I'm in Tampa Bay. So it hits home. I mean, I've been over the Skyway. I've been on the Courtney Campbell. These are all places I've been and frequently. Sucks sometimes when you think how really it's so beautiful, but it's still so tainted. Florida brings all the crazies. I, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's the heat, but we got all the fucking loony ticks. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> oh my goodness. Do you have a case that you want me to cover? It was just that simple. Even if you want to be a guest and talk about a crime, I'm cool with that. Ways to reach out to me are on my Instagram page or crimeovercocktails.com, which is the official webpage. Do not leave it on Facebook. I will not get it. If you love the show, show the show some love. Either share it with your friends, share it on your Facebook, your Instagram, wherever you would like to. Liking, subscribing, leaving a five-star review on Apple. For just $1 a month, can go a long way and it even comes with benefits that's right i'm not greedy i give early access to all patreons no matter which tier well all right you guys we'll talk crime another time good night